the Alps, from Slovenia to Switzerland, a journey across Europe's most prominent mountain range. Tyrol from above, a journey across rugged peaks. A geographer studies the glacial lakes with laser scanners. And Vatten celebrates the return of the Lederhose. In the oldest workshop in Austria, bells are founded that will last an eternity. Tyrol. The land in the mountains is the third largest state in Austria. Over the glaciers of the High Tauern Mountains, the journey leads deep into the Karwendel Mountains and ends in Innsbruck, the capital of Tyrol. The Inn Valley is the main route through Tyrol. From here, numerous small valleys branch off that are each connected by meltwater streams. Slightly off the beaten track is the small community of Angerberg. Tourists come here to go walking. But at five o'clock in the morning, all is quiet. Only one person is out so early. Martin Eigentler with his huskies. In winter, he takes part in sled dog races all over the world. In summer, he trains on wheels. The dogs are my best friends. I spend all day with them, and they make me a more balanced person. I no longer know what the word stress means. I get up in the morning and do what I enjoy doing most. Martin is a musher, the official term for the person who gives commands to sled dogs. He would only use one breed, Siberian Huskies. You can't really call huskies dogs. They're more like wild animals, very similar to wolves in their behavior. They're good runners and working animals, not really house pets. The first dog sleds were used by nomads in Siberia and Inuit in North America. During the gold rush in Alaska, the settlers discovered dog sledding. Breeding the canines requires stamina and leadership skills. Our 24 dogs live together in a pack. There is a strong hierarchy, just like in nature. I'm not the leader of the pack, I'm the coach. For me it's important that they trust me when I work with them. But when they're back in their enclosure, then I let them lead their life as a pack. Don't interfere. Humans shouldn't get involved everywhere. People don't think like dogs think. They're much too complicated. Dogs think more simply and logically. For many years, Martin was CEO of a chain supplying animal food. But the job didn't make him happy. Today, he gives dog sledding seminars and organizes husky camps for school classes. Steering a dog sled is very different from, say, a horse-drawn carriage where you have reins. You guide the dogs with your voice. The lead dogs need to follow my commands if I tell them to turn left or right or to stand. You have to teach the commands to the dogs, but unfortunately only the clever ones learn. There are seven lead dogs which understand the commands and can go at the front. In the second row I put young dogs which have potential. And right at the back are the dogs that just want to run. During the summer months, Martin can only train his huskies in the early hours of the morning. The dogs are accustomed to snow and the cold, 
and find the high temperatures too much to bear. It can drive their pulse up to 300 beats per minute. They keep catching new scents and it's a great motivation for them to explore the area. And that can go on for hours. They can run on for a long time and still be motivated because they want to know what's new out there. Today it's almost too hot for the huskies. Martin has to stop the training at 15 degrees to prevent the dogs from becoming dehydrated. I only reward my dogs with affection. I never give them food as a treat, but stroke them, give them some attention. The advantage is that the dogs don't start to beg. If I forgot to bring along treats, the dogs would be offended. But I can give them a bit of fuss and attention any time. That's just as important for the dogs as food. The dogs are only fed once a day. We feed our dogs beef, 30 kilos a day, a mix of muscle meat, entrails, cartilage, fat, tissue. I get it from the slaughterhouse to give them something similar to what they'd have in the wild. I want to make sure that dogs have a healthy diet. The ingredients of the dog food you can buy would damage their bodies in the long run. The dogs would never eat wheat in the wild or corn, rice or soya, and that's why we only serve them fresh meat. Martin has already won the European Championship with his dogs. Now he's aiming for the world title. When I work with the dogs, I feel part of them and of nature. That really means a lot to me. I couldn't live without them anymore. No day without dogs for the past 12 years. The history of Tyrol was often marked by military battles. Its location made it a desirable conquest. The possession of Tyrol meant dominance over the gateway to Rome. From Angerberg the journey continues to Kramsach by the River Inn. Here begin the foothills of the Brandenburg Alps. Extreme weather conditions and steep inclines make life hard for the mountain farmers. Often, only hand-operated harvesters can manage the impassable terrain. Mountain farming is subsidized by the government. It's important as it prevents landslides. A century-old delicacy is produced that's popular all over Tyrol. Prügeltorte, a layered cake. A Tyrolean family keeps the culinary tradition alive. Jeanette Marder still knows how it's made. It's the only cake that is baked over an open fire. The recipe has been around for a long time. It dates back to the 15th century, when they would cook things on a spit. That's why it's made like that. Jeanette learned the recipe from her mother, who learned it from her mother. After qualifying as a confectioner, Jeanette came to work in her parents' bakery, a job that gives her a lot of pleasure. I really enjoy it, especially carrying on the tradition. And it's nice being able to make cakes for people to eat on special occasions. During the summer months, the Marda family bakes outside almost every weekend, in the museum village. Jeanette's boyfriend Sandro normally works as a wine dealer, but he likes helping out with the cake production. 
First you beat the butter until it's creamy, then add sugar. Only then should you add the eggs and right at the end the flour. Obelia's skewered pastries date as far back as ancient Greece. The recipe for the dough is easy enough. The art is in baking the cake the right way. The wood stove isn't always easy to handle, and the heat only comes from below. The dough must be spread onto a thick spit, the so-called bruge. This club is made of beech wood, as it retains the heat particularly well. Layer after layer of dough is added, while the spit rotates, so the cake doesn't burn. After two hours, it is ready. When it is freshly baked, the cake is relatively crunchy, but after a while the humidity in the air makes it softer, as it contains a lot of butter. You can eat it at any time of day. It goes well with coffee, tea, wine, cranberry jam or vanilla ice cream, and perhaps also a dash of whipped cream. The journey continues to the Kitzbühel Alps. This secluded high valley extends over 24 kilometers. From the air they appear as stripes in the mountain fields, the cow paths. The animals spend the summer at an altitude of 1500 meters. Wildschönau is the Valley of Farmyards. Almost 260 are still in operation. Without through traffic or industry, a valley like an island. In the village of Tierbach, the people have also traditionally lived off agriculture. Slowly other professions are emerging. Now and again, a loud rumbling disrupts the peace. Conrad Gruber constructs and tunes these racers, high-powered sports cars that come at a price. If you have vehicles over 800 horsepower, then you really have to get used to the rate of acceleration. But I think that's what fascinates people most, taming this incredible engine power. Our tuning is at the high end of performance boosting. Of course, you really do get close to the limit. That requires complex systems, all of which are produced in-house. Konrad Gruber has been all over the world. He's been to Dubai, Japan and the USA, and always returned home. His wealthy clients like to keep things discreet. Among them are oil shakes and Hollywood stars. Conrad Gruber assists those who aren't satisfied with the Lamborghini's basic fittings. In his workshop, he transforms 500 into 850 horsepower. Usually the sports cars that we deal with have conventional induction engines and we extend them with compressors or turbos or a combination of the two. That gives you higher results in speed, acceleration, etc. Conrad could have taken over his father's farm, but he didn't feel that driving a tractor was his destiny. He was more attracted by the car mechanics that specialized in fast cars. Later, he converted his father's farm into a workshop. Natürlich. 
Of course, I stand out up here, because not many people understand what I actually do. It's hard when you don't carry on the family's farm, and there are a lot of obstacles to overcome along the way. He feels most at ease when he's in his workshop. The compressors, turbochargers and high-performance radiators are all his own handiwork. I'm always busy carrying out tests or developing something new. I'm always on the go, really. That started early on. I read many books about different cars and I always had a great sports car myself. So I'm just satisfying my own fascination. Conrad couldn't wish for a better test track than the windy mountain roads of Wildschönau. And on many of the small private roads, there's no speed limit. the perfect conditions for a sports car enthusiast, if he doesn't have to worry about dodging oncoming traffic. Only a few kilometers away, a very different vehicle brings the children of Uttendorf to school every day. A rare vintage motor produced by the Austrian company Steyr has been on the road since 1949. The former postbus 380A may not be fast, but it's all the more charming. They don't do things by halves in Kitzbühel. The small town has five churches right next to each other, but only three still have regular services. Kitzbühel is one of the major ski resorts in Austria. Even in summer, sports are on the agenda. For example, on one of the town's four golf courses. The journey continues to Obersulzbach Kies, a glacier in High Tower National Park. On the way there, snow and ice capped peaks. But the glaciers of the Alps are melting. The Little Ice Age ended around 150 years ago, a period of cooling that lasted for 600 years. Ever since, the Alpine glaciers have been receding. In only a few generations, they could already be history. The melting has caused lakes to form at the edge of the glaciers. Their ice-cold, milky-looking waters and are one of the most striking natural phenomena in the high mountains. And in future, perhaps also one of the most dangerous. Scientists are researching what would happen if the glaciers dissolved. What dangers would valleys be faced with if the ice masses released thousands of litres of meltwater per second, dragging along large quantities of rocks and rubble? Martin Geilhausen has made the Obersulzbach case the focus of his research. Someone who doesn't have the same background as I do might simply think that all looks a bit barren. There are lots of stones lying around. There is lots of rubble. But I see it in a different way. I try to read the landscape like a book. I take samples to analyze and understand what is happening. It's not really something your common or garden mountaineer would think about. From year to year, the glacier becomes more inaccessible. 
Stones and rubble lie where, not long before, ice had covered the ground. Where we're sitting now, we would have already been on the glacier 60 or 70 years ago and would have been walking with crampons. Obersulzbach Kies is one of the most distorted glaciers in Austria. One cubic meter of ice has melted here over the past 160 years and the glacier has collapsed into several parts. Martin is writing his doctorate about this process. Old paths have simply disappeared. In their place, a new lake has formed that didn't even exist 10 years ago. The trail map should constantly be redrawn. Martin records the changes with a laser device. It's a so-called terrestrial laser scanner. It's just a normal scanner, like you would find in a supermarket. But instead of scanning barcodes or price tags, I'm scanning the landscape. It can turn on its own axis at 360 degrees. It sends out 10 to 12,000 laser beams per second. They travel through the air at almost the speed of light hit surfaces, are reflected and then recorded. The records he's made over the years show how the surface has changed to the exact centimeter. His findings could become very important for the movements of the mountain are threatening dams, train lines or roads in the valley. As the mountain rescue service can't reach the slopes on the opposite side on foot anymore, they have a rowing boat at anchor in the new lake in case of emergency. Martin and his colleague may use it on their research trips. Martin is interested in the life expectancy of the newly formed lake. How long will it remain? Every day, more meltwater flows into it, and with it, fine sediment that makes its murky colour. Because of the meltwater, it's also called glacial milk. Martin uses the probe to measure particles in the water. He's discovered that less particles flow out than new ones are added. The result? the new lake is silting up more and more and will soon disappear. For Martin, it isn't frustrating, just part of an exciting geological process. I like spending time on the mountain in my spare time too. I enjoy climbing or hiking. I like the challenge of climbing to great heights, with a heavy backpack or without. And it's a wonderful thing that I can combine this with my job. Another result of glacial melt, the Krimmel waterfalls. With a height of 385 meters, they're the highest in Austria. The journey continues to Weidener Hütte in the Tux Alps. From the air, extreme skiers can be seen on the glaciers. They climb to the summit of a mountain and ski down over the deep snow fields and ice channels. Skiing beyond the pistes 
means avoiding rocks and dodging vegetation with daring jumps and down almost vertical slopes. There's a high risk of avalanches and falls. The mountain rescue team are frequently called out with their helicopters. In 2008, they came to the aid of 1,600 people. But most of the serious accidents occur on relatively safe terrain. Many inexperienced mountaineers overestimate their strength. Since the 19th century, mountaineering groups all over the Alps have erected mountain refuges. Many of the huts also have an attached restaurant, so they not only offer a bed for the night, but also a delicious meal. The word has spread through the world. Tyrol is a popular training area for Sherpas from the Himalayas. My name is Pasang Ongtulama, and I'm from Nepal, and my place is called Tameteng. It's around 3,900 meters. At the moment, I work at Biden University in Austria. It's Passang's fourth time in the Alps. As part of an exchange program, 10 Sherpas work in the Tyrolean huts and learn how an Austrian inn works. The project is geared towards teaching the Sherpas who work here, so that when they go home they can open up their own lodge or a small inn. They get to know the mentality of the people. There are many Austrians, many Germans over there who go hiking. So then they know how to treat them right, regarding food, culture, and they just know what they want. Sang is being introduced to the Austrian cuisine. Today, Presskastknödel are on the menu, a Tyrolean delicacy. Here we make different kinds of fruits, like schnitzel, cordon bleu. Only a few fruits are similar between Nepal and here, like rice funny. We will uh, prepare the same, like rice funny in Nepal also and noodles for pay. With his current job, Passang can support a family of nine. He's the oldest of seven children. His salary pays for his sister's school fees. But living so far from home is not easy. At the first time, I was feeling a little boring because I was new, 10 days, 15 days. Now. I don't feel boring, no more homesick. My family and other people, they can contact by writing email or by phone. Pasang doesn't know many people in Tyrol. That leaves plenty of time to study, German grammar and vocabulary. The people who come here at the first time, I think it will be very difficult because we should know about the language, about working systems, we should know about the dialogues. If we don't understand, this, this will be the problem. It has snowed during the night. Soon the last summer guests will have gone and it will become very peaceful up here. We are, of course, happy that they come here. It's hard to find good staff up here in the huts. The more secluded huts are almost cut off from civilization. And some of the people who work there sometimes get fed up of it. The Sherpas are used to it. He has such an aura of calm about him. It's amazing. In three weeks, Passang will go back home for a while. He's built a house there, and with the earnings of this summer, he wants to buy windows. In winter, he will return to Austria. The 
the journey leads over the Karwendel Mountains to Pertisau on Lake Achensee. Achensee is the largest lake in Tyrol, and it's also considered the most beautiful. Due to its clean water, you can see 10 meters far underwater. Lake Achensee is popular with windsurfers, sailors and paragliders. Due to its ideal wind condition, it's also called the Sea of Tyrol. Not far away, the Renaissance castle Tratzberg emerges. Over the centuries, it belonged to different aristocratic families. Today, part of it can be visited as a museum. The formation of the Alps began 70 million years ago. They rose up out of the large ancient Mediterranean Sea that stretched across large parts of Europe. In the Alpine rock, the remains of fossils can be found. Hermann and Bernhard Albrecht, father and son, are drilling for rock oil that lies inside the slate of the Karwendel Mountains. Rock oil isn't a new thing. Farmers in the 16th century already knew about it. They found this oil shale in the Karwendel Mountains and used it on humans and animals back then. Since 1902, the Albrecht family have drilled for oil shale in Bechental Valley. I always accompanied my father to Bechental when I was a little boy, already at the age of three, four, five. I've always come here and helped out. You have to weld and mine. There are different tasks that are a part of it, and I really enjoy that. While the other family members work on marketing the oil, Hermann and Bernhard are responsible for the manual work. Plastic explosive is used to blast the stones out of the rock. A dangerous job, but requires the utmost concentration. When the explosives are filled into the blast hole, the fuse is fixed to the wire. The wire leads to a safe place far enough away from the explosion, so that we aren't hit by flying stones. And when the signal is given, the detonator is attached, which sends an electrical charge of around 1000 volts through the circuit, causing the fuses to detonate. In summer, the two spend weeks on end up at 1500 meters. It's a short season. When the first snow falls, they have to stop. There aren't many distractions around here. There isn't even mobile phone reception. In 24 hours, we collect about two tons, but we want to optimize the system to work up to three tons in 24 hours. Good job, Bernard Mockstrom. The bulldozer can do part of the job, but many things are still done by hand. The shale is transported down to the valley with a zip line. 
It's a very physical job, but that's part of the pleasure. When I've done a day's work, I come home tired and know that I've achieved something. The delivery zip line runs without an engine. A simple but ingenious principle makes it possible. The zip line is propelled by the forces of gravity. There are two buckets that are filled with stones and then pushed into the valley. The heavier one is decelerated by the other, lighter one, which is pushed up to the mountain station. And then vice versa. First one, then the other transports the material down to the distillery. In the large ovens, the stones are heated up to 450 degrees. The rock oil evaporates and is conducted through pipes to a refinery. We, of course, work day and night. We regularly work shifts. When the ovens are hot, you can't turn them on and off. When they've reached the right temperature, you have to maintain it. As soon as the rock oil has evaporated, you have to keep the ovens going. In cooling towers, the oil regains its original liquid form. It's then processed further. But Tyrolean rock oil doesn't serve as engine fuel. The oil is only used for pharmaceutical or cosmetic purposes. For example, as bath essence, massage oil or body tonic for the back or the joints. It also eases the muscles after sport. Or if you've been lying in an awkward position, then it can relieve tension in the body. For those things, it's ideal. Rock oil is particularly used by spa hotels around Lake Achensee. Pleasant relaxation created by hard manual labor. The next stop on the journey is Vattens, in the lower Intal Valley. The town is small but highly productive. The main sources of income are crystal glass, jewellery and the paper industry. And an Alpine tradition is also celebrating its revival. A photo shoot with models sporting the Tyrolean look. The traditional Trachten costumes were long considered to be outdated. Lederhosen and Dirndl dresses were only worn by the older generation. How did the Lederhosen come back into fashion? I think they're perceived as both traditional and modern. No one here would say that Lederhosen were old-fashioned. That's just the way it is here. And you can combine them in a modern way. They belong to us and are part of our identity. The origin of the Lederhosen was the culotte, tightly fitted courtly knickerbockers. The people of the Alps transferred the patterns onto buckskin and created a durable version of the courtly fashion. Lederhosen have always been worn in the Alps. Why were or why are they worn? Firstly, because it's a natural material, which has always been available here. That makes it a long-lasting product. Good pair of Lederhosen last a lifetime. Many are inherited, and they look good. Lederhosen suit everyone. Christine Miller learned the craft from scratch. She was trained by a leather tailor. One day, she and Trachten tailor Sabine Lindner decided to set up business together. 
Today, they can hardly keep up with the production to satisfy the steadily rising demand. The customers can tell us that they would like to have the same embroidery as their grandfather had. We can incorporate that and they can have a say during the whole process. They can change any detail they wish. The workshop's main customers are brass bands and historical societies. But other people have also started wearing lederhosen again. Both young and old people wear lederhosen. It all depends how you combine it. You can wear traditional knee socks, dirty shoes and a shirt. Or a young man can also wear them with flip-flops. Why not? I've even seen them worn with a Metallica t-shirt. I think it's just as normal as wearing a pair of jeans. Suddenly, everyone wanted traditionally made lederhosen again, despite prices of up to 1,000 euros and cheaper competitors from Asia. The best and most durable material is buckskin. It grows with the wearer, doesn't need to be washed, and lasts a lifetime. Christina cuts its shape by hand. It would be quicker with a machine, but it's part of the tradition of an ancient craft and what makes the trousers so precious to their wearer. That's what distinguishes them from something bought from the rack. The embroidery is also still hand-stitched with a leather needle. Those who want their own custom-made lederhose need to be patient. Delivery takes at least eight weeks. The best part for me is if I bump into the customer weeks or months later and they're wearing the garment I've made for them. And it's just priceless seeing how happy they are, that they now also have a pair. It just makes me proud and happy too. From Wattens, the route continues to nearby Innsbruck, the capital of Tyrol. <music> 250 meters above the city is Berg Esel Ski Jump, built by the world famous British Iraqi architect Zaha Hadid. The arena can hold 28,000 sports fans. Innsbruck was settled over 3,000 years ago. Today the city attracts many students and winter sports tourists. And it is home to the oldest workshop in Austria. At the Grasmeyer Bell Foundry, bells have been produced since 1599. The secrets of the trade have passed on from one generation of the Grasmeyer family to the next. For Johannes Grasmeyer, his profession is an almost mystical craft. Many people aren't aware of what a bell constitutes. It does more than just chime the hour, send out messages or warn about storms. It's deeply rooted in our heritage and our life. It chimes at the baptism, then the wedding, and finally the funeral. Not many people know that bells are actually musical instruments with many different tones that can be very atmospheric.
The larger the bell, the deeper are the partial tones. And people say that large bells have a more humble sound. That already shows that the chime of a bell isn't just a sound or music, but that it moves people. Johannes Grassmeier was born into the profession. When he and his brother Peter took on the bell foundry, he realized that tradition wasn't enough to ensure the survival of the company. Many new competitors from Eastern Europe already made bells at a much lower price. He knew that he had to take the bull by the horns. We mustn't try to make the cheapest, but should make the best bells in the world. Accordingly, we felt a great desire to make the Stradivari of all bells. But we also employed a different tactic. We looked at the old books about the trade belonging to our ancestors, and it was exciting to see what materials they used to make the bells. The most important material is clay, into which calves' hair, shredded barley, horse dung, beer and sugar molasses are mixed. Those are the ingredients for the right kind of clay. Clay is shaped into the bell casting mould. The ingredients must ferment for six months to gain the right consistency. Embellishments play a large role. Religious motifs are to fend off evil powers. We have an archive with images. Some of them are probably 300 to 400 years old. There are many holy figures, as for example, Holy Francis of Assisi. The bell is actually not just a musical instrument. It's a spiritual instrument. And we're convinced that the images and texts on the bell are sent out as a message through the bell's chime. In the workshop, the sculptors make shapes out of wax, angel heads, the outlines of cities, holy images. The Grassmeyers not only produce bells for Catholic churches, but also for Protestant and Orthodox houses of worship and even for Buddhist temples. The first bells were made in ancient China. They were only brought to Europe in the 6th century by Irish missionaries. Today, they're an integral part of Occidental heritage. Today, another bell is due to be cast. For six hours, a copper and tin alloy will be heated in the furnace, up to 1150 degrees. Casting bells is more than just producing something. And as bell casting is the culmination of our work on the bells, it's a great ritual. People from all around, for whom the bells are being made, they come to pray for the bells to turn out well. So we pray together that they will give pleasure and peace to many people in future when they chime. Johannes and his staff are protected from the fiery masses by protective clothes made of heat-resistant Kevlar material a synthetic fiber from aerospace research. They stir the liquid metal with long poles made of alder wood. This brings locked-in bubbles to the surface, which would make the bell porous and ruin its sound. They're moist tree trunks. They burn up when they enter the metal bath and the moisture from the tree trunks evaporates, sucking the gas out of the metal at the same time. And that's very important, as the final cast bell must be made of a very pure metal, without air bubbles or gas. Schiller already wrote in his Song of the Bell, beautifully jagged is the fracture. 
Every church congregation comes to see their bell be cast. It's part of the Grassmeyer Company's philosophy to open the doors of their bell foundry. After casting, it takes a week for the metal to solidify so that it can be fettled off. There's an English saying, to be as surprised as a bell founder. That really says it all and conveys the tension before the bell is unpacked, whether the bell will be like the shape it was cast as. The special thing about our work is that what we make won't just give pleasure to people next week, but for the next 500 years. That means what we make now lasts an eternity.